graceful exits from Trump world, but this one may take the cake for combining the three central pillars of a Trumpian exit, a presidential lie, a presidential tweet, and a public relations debacle of epic proportions for Donald Trump. News that he'd invited the terrorist group that supported the 9-11 terrorists to Camp David during the week of the 9-11 anniversary. The news breaking today that John Bolton, Donald Trump's third national security advisor, is out. Donald Trump claiming that he ousted Bolton over policy disagreements, while Bolton maintains that he offered to resign last night and turned in that resignation this morning. And whatever you thought of Bolton's foreign policy views, he was largely seen as a check on some of the president's most reckless and childlike impulses. Things like sucking up to Kim Jong-un and staging a summit with the Taliban at Camp David. His abrupt resignation came as a surprise to the West Wing. New York Times reporting, quote, the National Security Advisor's dismissal came so abruptly that it was announced barely an hour after the White House scheduled a briefing for 1.30, where Mr. Bolton was supposed to appear alongside Secretary of State Pompeo and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin. But Mr. Bolton is reported to have now left the White House. Trump fired off a tweet indicating there were disagreements about policy. We've learned one of those was that kumbaya with the Taliban, which Bolton reportedly described as, quote, getting in bed with killers swathed in American blood. Bolton also skipped Donald Trump's trip across the DMZ into North Korea. Trump is accompanied by Ivanka instead. Bolton joins former Defense Secretary Jim Mattis, who also left over foreign policy disagreements with Donald Trump. In Mattis' case, it was a disagreement about Syria policy. Trump has also seen the departure of his DNI Dan Coats after disagreements about North Korea and Russia, among other foreign policy flashpoints. Mattis and Coates, plus former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, Homeland Security Chief Kirsten Nielsen, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, and now Bolton, round out a growing list of top security officials ousted over clashes with the president. The breaking news is where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. With us from the Washington Post, White House reporter Ashley Parker and national political reporter Robert Costa, NBC News correspondent Carol Lee, plus former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI, Frank Figluzzi. With us on set, former deputy White House chief of staff for President Obama, Jim Messina. Robert Costa, I'm going to start with you because it has felt like taffy watching a little bit of pull at the highest levels of this white house and this cabinet over this meeting with the taliban um take me inside what at different times this week has seemed like maybe pence aligning himself with bolton who sounds like he was aghast based on that quote about what the taliban leaders would represent at camp david terrorists swathed in american blood um, no surprise that after a big public relations mess, the person who disagreed with Donald Trump publicly is out. And you also have someone who never really built a rapport with President Trump on a personal level and had real policy disagreements. I have been in touch with Ambassador Bolton all day and with his allies. And the picture being painted by both him and people in his inner circle is that it just reached a breaking point, a culmination of frustrations with this president's position, not only on Afghanistan, but on North Korea, his approach to foreign policy in general. And the Taliban meeting, the proposal to come at Camp David, it really broke with the mainstream hawkish view of Ambassador Bolton and in a conversation Monday in the Oval Office, it came to a head and he offered his resignation and the president didn't really say, I want you to stay. And so the ambassador spent Monday night thinking it through and ultimately submitted his resignation on Tuesday. Frank Figluzzi, um, I had a conversation with a former intelligence official who said only Donald Trump could make you miss John Bolton's presence. Talk about, I mean, these are policy disagreements in the classic sense that we describe policy disagreements among a president and his cabinet. This is Donald Trump watching TV, sort of articulating the urge to be closer, to write love letters to Kim Jong-un, a murderous dictator. This is Donald Trump with such a, um, a, a cluelessness about the role, perhaps, that the Taliban played, that he saw nothing wrong with hosting them at Camp David two days before the anniversary of 9-11. Just talk about whether it's Mattis leaving over Syria, Bolton leaving after the Taliban divide, um, DNI Coates leaving after Donald Trump suggested all the intel chiefs go back to school. What must it be like for, again, wherever they fall in the ideological spectrum, professionals to work for someone like Trump? 
So based on the departures we've seen, as you rattled off uh, in your intro, this does seem to be far less about philosophy and geopolitical strategy and far more about the president's unwillingness to accept the truth and hard, raw intel and data. It seems like those who are in the know, those who present him with intelligence, uh, Putin's poisoning people. North Korea is advancing its nuclear program. The crown prince of Saudi Arabia was directly involved in the murder of a journalist. Those people can't last in an administration where the truth runs counter to the narrative the president is trying to spin. He simply doesn't want to hear it. So agree, disagree with Bolton, Hawk, Dove. That's really not what appears to be at the heart of this. And my concern looking at this geopolitically is is we are not projecting strength, stability to our allies, to our adversaries, and instead we're projecting chaos and uncertainty. That makes us less of a leader in this world and far more vulnerable to our adversaries. Carol Lee, you've got some reporting that sort of puts us back into Donald Trump, the reality star. He was talking to the season two national security advisor about replacing the season three national security advisor. Of course, the season one national security advisor was in court today learning that his criminal sentencing would be later in December. Talk about what you're reporting exclusively about Donald Trump's um, lifeline to the man he fired to install Bolton. Sure. Well, what we learned, Nicole, is that President Trump started reaching out to uh, for his former national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, last fall, uh, about six months after Bolton had come in to the White House. And by the way, he came into the White House with much fanfare. There was a lot of excitement. Everyone called him Trump's new it boy, his new favorite. Uh, McMaster was unceremoniously fired as well. It was announced on Twitter. It was, you know, it was caught off guard. Um, and what we learned is that as Trump sort of soured on Bolton or questioned whether or not he, you know, he should have confidence in him, he's called McMaster from time to time. He's told him he misses him. Uh, he's told people around him that he misses <laughs> McMaster. Um, and he's asked at times for, you know, policy, like advice, you know, who, who should I name as my next defense secretary? One call, uh, sources told us, was particularly about Iran, which, as you know, is, is Bolton's main issue. Um, and so, it was kind of presaged what we see here, and and which is that Bolton is now out. Um, but it's also typical of a president who tends to sour on somebody and then go and reach out to them afterwards when he's souring on their replacement. If you remember, we saw this with his uh, former chief of staff, Ryan's Priebus, and then you know he started John Kelly started telling him things he needed to do that he didn't want to do, and so he'd call Ryan's Priebus. Um, so it's kind of a familiar pattern, but one that um, it certainly was unexpected. Carol, you've also got some reporting, and there's, there's sort of something in the water about the coverage of the scuttled meeting with the Taliban, mm -hmm. that what Donald Trump expected was for everyone to fall in line, that the vice president, when he put out that tweet saying, I never disagreed um, with Donald Trump, was what he expected from everybody. He didn't get that yeah. from John Bolton. That's right. And, you know, and, and he hasn't and he wouldn't. That's just not how John Bolton operates. But, you know, if you take all the culmination of tensions and policy differences that have that over the last uh, however many months it's been since Bolton came in, I think 17, um, you know, that if you take that and then what happened over the weekend where, you know, there was reporting, including by us at NBC, about Pence agreeing with Bolton and expressing concerns about this Taliban meeting. Pence is somebody who likes to give his counsel to the president very in keep that very private. Um, there were frustrations that add fueled frustrations and tensions um, between Bolton's team and Pence's team. Uh, and the president was irritated that, you know, Pence went out and said, I didn't, I agree with the president, I fully support this, and that Bolton wouldn't do that. And, you know. But Pence didn't agree with the president. Didn't, what, what is Pence's, what, what is the official position of Mike Pence on meeting with the terrorists at Camp David? Well, what we were told was that that Mike Pence expressed concerns about that meeting, which, you know, if you want to dissect that, that would suggest that he's certainly not for a meeting uh, with the Taliban at Camp David. But I think the difference is, um, you know, and John Bolton has done this on a number of issues. Pence will get on board. John Bolton will just stick to his guns and try to scuttle a policy. And that's the that's where the frustrations um, mounted on both by the president and other people around him with John Bolton. Ashley Parker, I was for it before I was against it. I know how that movie ends. Take me inside 
What is really going on in terms of the president casting about? I'm told he's bored, that he doesn't enjoy the company of any of the, I think they're mostly men other than Kellyanne Conway, who advise him at the highest levels. Mick Mulvaney, it's my understanding, has his own national security advisor. So other than advising Trump on national security, which they didn't agree on, it's, it's, it's not clear what hole is left open by today's departure. What's the search look like for the next, the fourth, John Bolton? That's a great question. To go inside a little, the president just in general, and this is putting aside the recent Bolton news, our understanding is has been very frustrated, very unhappy with the way the past couple of months, frankly, have shaped up. There have been a lot of departures um, for a number of reasons of people quite close to him, people who understood him, knew how to manage his moods and his whims to the extent that they can be managed. And he is, again, he is a bit frustrated, a bit unhappy, and he is taking it out on his remaining staff. I just want to go back to Bolton in particular quickly and make one point. Everyone pointed out correctly that there were really fundamental disagreements between the two men. The president doesn't have that much when it comes to a core ideology, but one of those cores is being generally non-interventionalist, and that is the exact opposite of who John Bolton is and has been for decades. But people said the president doesn't actually mind disagreements. He actually sort of likes gladiator fights among his aides. The real sin with Bolton was once there was a disagreement, unlike Pence, once the president made a decision, Bolton did not get on board. He still kept on making his hawkish points uh, privately in meetings, and then there was a specific suspicion within the White House that he was leaking flattering stories to himself in the press. When he lost, he would leak what his position was and how he tried to stop a decision he didn't agree with. And even there was frustration that when he won an internal fight, instead of giving the president the credit, he would leak that as well. And that seemed to be the discussion in the White House, that that was more the sin than the actual core of the foreign policy disagreements, although, of course, that didn't help either. And that would make sense, Jim, because anyone um, who watches as much Fox News as Donald Trump does knows exactly where John Bolton comes down on love letters with Kim Jong-un, on FTSE with Putin, on um, Iran. I mean, he hired someone who was on the network he watches like an addict. Yeah, it's crazy. Season three of The Trump Show is the craziest year of all. It right? sure is. It, it really is nuts. On the same hour, he's firing his third national security advisor. His first one is in federal court getting his. You couldn't make it up. You couldn't make it up. And that's why the programming is so exciting this year, right? <laughs> it really is. The bad part is this is the world affairs like right. crumbling around us, right? And the other piece of bad news is on this fight, John Bolton was right. Like, you know, you and I have served in the White House. There's no normal person who thought that bringing the Taliban on the week of 9-11 to Camp David, the place where Churchill and, uh, and Roosevelt negotiated World War II, the place where Khrushchev and Eisenhower went after each other, you're going to bring some of our biggest terrorist enemies there on that week. And Bolton stood up to him and told him he was wrong. And 48 hours later, he's gone. And what's the lesson, right? The lesson is mm -hmm. if you oppose this president and if you try to give him rational advice, and I'm no John Bolton apologist. I think I disagree with him on most issues. But on this, he's right. And what did he get for it? He got, he got a, fired. He got fired embarrassingly, and the president trashed him on his way out. You know, Robert Costa, it, it is such a good point. And, and we we all, uh, myself included, chase the shiny objects of the drama of the moment. Um, but 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 he was right. And I have talked to a couple folks in and close to this national security team. I haven't found any defenders of the Camp David summit with the Taliban. So what's going on with Mike Pompeo? I remember him when he was in Congress. He was almost an ideological DNA twin to John Bolton. What, what's his, what's changed with, I mean, what's going on with Mike Pompeo? He's winning the internal battle inside of this administration for power. And the move today, the resignation of Ambassador Bolton is widely seen inside of the White House as an assertion of Secretary Pompeo of his grip on where this administration's going on foreign policy. He, he has a defense secretary and who's very new, still getting a hold of the job. You have a national security advisor who's now gone and a strong personality who's out the door. And you have a secretary of state who has a real hand, not only in diplomacy, but in military policy, global strategy, and who has this rapport going back to his days at CIA when he gave the president the daily brief. And so everyone inside this White House said, pay attention to that smile. 
by Secretary Pompeo today in the White House briefing room. That was a man who was in control. Former CIA Director John Brennan, now a senior national security analyst for NBC News, joins us now by phone. Director Brennan, I just want your thoughts about Speaker Pelosi's uh, <laughs> statement today. She put out um, this comment via tweet. John Bolton's sudden departure is a symbol of the disarray that has unnerved our allies since day one of the Trump administration. Steady leadership and strategic foreign policy is key to ensuring America's national security. I am sure that Nancy Pelosi and John Bolton have vast canyons of disagreement along the lines of Jim Messina's with someone like John Bolton. But even Nancy Pelosi today warning of disarray chaos, unnerved allies from his sudden and abrupt departure by tweet. Do you share those concerns? Well, absolutely. I think our foreign partners, as well as adversaries, have already detected a significant amount of disarray and chaos in the national security establishment. This just is one more example of just how serious this issue is. And so, that, you know, there are a number of things that, you know, I think about when I see Bolton being fired. One is, it's not really all that surprising. There is philosophical and ideological differences between Trump and Bolton. Bolton is a hardline interventionist. He is not somebody who wanted to pursue any type of diplomatic initiatives, you know, certainly not with the Taliban. And so they've, you know, they've gone on this, this long, um, but I think it came to a point where those differences really were going to just be very counterproductive to what Trump wants to accomplish. And Bolton is not a, a person who's going to be politically obsequious to Trump the way a Mike Pompeo is. As the question was just raised, why is Pompeo willing to go along with this? Well, because he's a political animal and wants to make sure he's able to genuflect this at Trump also. Secondly, uh, Bolton is, was somebody who was a very self-centered national security advisor. He is not somebody who really, you know, leveraged the, the interagency the way a national security advisor should do it. He thought he was the smartest person around and was very assertive and uh, very singular in his views. Uh, so it's not as though... Uh, you know, we're losing a national security advisor who really was trying to bring together that interagency in a harmonious way to give us strong national security policy. And third, I just wonder how much of this was, you know, the timing of it is a uh, design by Trump to be a distraction from all the other problems he has. Mm -hmm. You know, the Taliban debacle with Camp Davis, the Air Force debacle as far as the stop. Scotland over uh, refueling stops, uh, Russia and the CIA, all these things. So what does Trump traditionally do? He throws out another golden nugget that is going to cause, you know, the media, uh, as we are right now, looking at something other than those things that really were, I think, further tarnishing Trump's already uh, – damaged reputation. I think you're right, and it's taking a toll. Donald Trump is at 38 percent in new polls that are out today. And one of the things that preceded that new low point, I think, um, in his polling is this week-long assault on the weather, drawing with a pen around a map. And, and I wonder if you take something so stupid, so idiotic, taking a pen and altering a weather forecast, and you lay it into what must be his approach behind closed doors to the most delicate and, and consequential kinds of matters, the diplomacy or, or not with North Korea, um, questions about what to do um, in, in Iran, an incredibly volatile part of the world. What do you think that looks like? Someone willing to take a pen to a map that we can all see. What is happening behind closed doors with the national security team? Well, I think it, again, raises serious questions uh, around the globe as well as in the U.S. government about what else is Mr. Trump being dishonest about? What else is he trying to manipulate and exploit? What else is he trying to misrepresent in order to you know, further advance his own personal objectives and agenda? Uh, it must be very demoralizing. And I'm very glad that the director of the National Weather Service uh, you know, has stood up. And we need more individuals like that who are going to say, enough. I'm not going to allow someone like a Mr. Trump to trample upon the institutions and the integrity and the, the work and professionalism of these uh, men and women who do their work every day. And so uh, I'm still surprised that 38 percent of the American public uh, you know, support him. Uh, but I would think that, you know, as you pointed out, the Alabama debacle, along with all the others, uh, certainly, I, I hope, is going to really reveal and to uh, show just how dishonest, how unfit, uh, and how basically incompetent uh, Mr. Trump has been in managing both the affairs of state uh, internationally as well as our domestic affairs.
My last question for you is about corruption. There's a flurry of stories in this post Labor Day short, short, short time that we've been back about questions about whether the Air Force uh, made decisions that enriched Donald Trump's properties, new reporting um, about Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, essentially issuing an edict that no one should contradict Trump um, on his erroneous forecast for Alabama days after that was the direction of the storm. I, I just want to ask you more broadly about corruption. Do you think that, that the sort of signals of corruption, which Jim Comey basically disclosed in his book, A Higher Loyalty, that his first meeting with Team Trump felt like sort of walking into a, a, a mob-like environment. Do you think that this is what um, heads of state around the world are seeing coming from the American presidency? Absolutely. And they see Mr. Trump taking a page out of the playbook of authoritarian leaders around the world in terms of nepotism, in terms of corruption, in terms of misrepresenting the facts. That's what dictators and despots have done, is to manipulate the perceptions of their public. And so, again, Mr. Trump is doing everything possible to burnish his image and to continue to play to that core constituency, his base. Uh, and uh, by doing that, he is corrupting the, uh, the, the U.S. government's uh, reputation uh, around the world, which I think is, is very, very damaging and uh, I think is going to have uh, some lasting uh, effects because uh, people looking at if the president of the United States can do these things and get away with it for so long, What's to say that the next administrations are not going to have similar uh, traits that uh, cause uh, concern to, uh, to so many? Former Director Brennan, thank you so much for spending some time with us. We're always grateful to have you. Frank Figluzzi, I'm coming right back to you. I mean, we have spent so much time talking about these questions that have hung over this administration about whether or not the president was a wit. I believe it was Director Brennan's testimony that put some of this in motion, whether he was wittingly or unwittingly aided by Russians. It would seem that this question about corruption is sort of the post Mueller cloud hanging over this presidency. And so far, it looks like it's doing a lot more damage to his poll numbers. There have been, as I said, a flurry of stories about potential corruption, whether it's lobbying lobbyists and lawmakers at the Trump Hotel every Tuesday, as the New York Times has reported, whether it's sort of a, a, a corrupt sense hanging over any sort of interactions with the Ukrainians, whether it's urging um, our allies to allow Putin back into the G8, and whether it's the stories I, I asked Director Brennan about, about whether the Air Force is enriching Trump, Trump properties wittingly or unwittingly in Scotland. What, what do you make of sort of the, 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 the second phase cloud over this administration, a question of corruption at the highest levels? Yeah, you're, you're onto something here. And I'm, I'm going to harken back to a major public corruption case I was uh, supervising in a, in a major American city against a very high ranking elected official who was loved by his base, his constituency, because although he was unorthodox, he got things done for people who voted for him. And then as the case developed and people realized he was getting things done to line his own pockets, the base started breaking away from him and he eventually went down in flames. I think the American people, once they get a whiff of the way in which he's lining, this president is lining his own pockets, they start to get a bad taste in their mouth. Americans don't go for that. They'll go for a lot of things. Guy who gets things done, he's unorthodox, he's challenging the establishment. But as they start to learn that he might be all about lining his pockets, Americans don't go for that, and I think this is going to bear fruit. Ashley Parker, let me give you the last word on this 38 percent. These low poll numbers, bad headlines, all of them Trump's triggers. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's why you see there, there's sort of two lines of reporting. There's what you're hearing behind the scenes, but a lot of it is out in public. And you can see what triggers the president if you watch his behavior, if he fires a top ranking official by tweet, if he lashes out at poll numbers, if he lashes out at the media, if he is reactive. And as much as the president will say that everything is fine, that he's had a great summer, if you just watch Watch, frankly, for his public tells, you can see that he is frustrated and you can see that he is being triggered. And the thing that triggers him most of all, of course, are polls.
Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.